last time you were stressed out? <laughs> I take that as on your way here. Maybe you were on your way to work, running late, and stuck in traffic. Or were you at home paying your monthly bills? Maybe you were just watching the five o'clock news. Your heart starts racing, your palms get sweaty, your stomach jumps into your throat. We experience these body sensations so often, we don't even know the difference now. So indulge me for a minute. If you have anything in your hands, just set it aside. Plant your feet firmly on the ground. Close your eyes. <clears throat> Inhale with me, in through the nose. Exhale through the mouth. Inhale through the nose. Exhale through the mouth. When you're ready, open your eyes. Congratulations, you just practiced self-care. <laughs> It can be that simple. Unfortunately, the $10 billion self-care industry doesn't want you to think so. There's this myth that's fed by Instagram posts and countless advertisements that self-care is a spa day, pedicures and Prosecco, a weekend-long Netflix binge, anything pumpkin spice related. <laughs> All these indulgences are great, but they're not self-care. We're left chasing these perfect self-care experiences and they don't actually restore us. So we're less, left with a question, if that's not self-care, what is self-care and how do I practice it? Self-care is deliberately taking care of your well-being through restorative activities. One of the greatest threats for our well-being is physical and emotional stress. Stress is one of the leading causes of healthcare issues in America. And we experience it every day. We experience stress by what we put in our bodies, what we put on our bodies, the thoughts that we think, and the choices that we make throughout our day. Some of the most stressful things that we can put in our bodies are sugar, alcohol, excessive caffeine, and processed foods. Those are also some of the most consumed items in America. So with all this stress impacting our immune system, our energy levels, our emotional well-being, it's essential that our self-care practice does the opposite. About a year ago, a coworker asked me what I did for self-care. I cringed when she asked me that question. I said, I eat and I sleep and that's enough, totally brushing her off. At the time, I was managing a high volume retail business in Washington, DC. My husband and I were starting a company and we're raising our two-year-old son. I started every day with coffee and a scone, went to work, had very few breaks, and finished my day watching Netflix and scrolling on my phone. I was in complete denial about what I needed to do to take care of myself. Ultimately, I burn out, and I quit my job. I decided to pursue a passion of mine, and I began working as a labor doula and a childbirth educator. Now, a large aspect of that job is to support pregnant women and prepare pregnant women to be as relaxed as possible during what could be a stressful event in a stressful environment. And I learned really quickly that to be successful at that, I had to be a relaxing presence, <laughs> which meant I had to take care of myself. And that's when I discovered how to practice self-care. My foundation began as a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole plant-based foods. And then I added in three restorative activities to make my self-care practice. The first, moments of stillness and in silence. We just practiced this a few minutes ago. We are bombarded by noise every day. The TV, the radio, traffic, our kids yelling at us. But the loudest noise of all is the voice in our heads. We have roughly 60,000 thoughts a day, and for some of us, 80% of those thoughts are negative. 
When we meditate and have moments of stillness and silence, it brings awareness to that internal voice. And when we have that awareness, that's when we can choose what thoughts we're holding on to and which we want to let go of. We can also adjust the volume on how loud that internal voice is. The first time I meditated, I was sitting in a chair and I immediately got squirmy and my back started hurting and my internal voice got so loud and it was talking about all the things I should be getting done on my to-do list versus sitting doing nothing. But I committed to five minutes a day and slowly but surely that voice got quieter. I have one suggestion for starting a powerful meditation or stillness practice and it's simply to be comfortable. You don't need to sit in a straight back rigid chair. You can actually be comfortable on your couch. I actually encourage you to be as comfortable as possible without falling asleep. <laughs> the second restorative activity I add in, added in was movement. This could be walking, running, dancing, yoga, jumping jacks on your living room, on your living room floor. Our bodies are meant to move. And when we move and when we exercise, it creates endorphins, which first, they help sleep, which naturally reduces our stress. And it also sends a positive feeling through the body that's similar to that of morphine. You don't need a fancy gym or trainer to do this, although they may help sometimes. And just 10 minutes a day makes a difference. The last restorative activity I added in was time and nature. According to environmental psychology, time in nature will improve your mood, reduce stress, and improve cognitive function. And the Environmental Protection Agency says that the average person spends 93% of their life indoors. So we're left with this incredible opportunity to support our well-being simply by going outside. We are animals of nature, and we often live completely disconnected from our natural environment. We may go days, if not weeks, without our bare hands or feet touching the ground. My son, he's almost three years old, and he's the most kinesthetic child out there. He loves being outside. If I let him, he'd spend all day outside, um, in the backyard, at the beach. And when he's outside, he's not just being outside. He is rubbing his hands into the dirt, he is touching leaves, trees, and catching frogs. And I could never understand why his shoes didn't stay on his feet for more than five minutes. But maybe he was onto something. The term earthing is now being used to describe your bare hands or feet on the ground, our earth. And there's a renowned cardiologist who says that the reduction of inflammation due to earthing can actually be documented by infrared imaging and white blood cell count. Some of the other benefits in, include reduced stress, improved sleep, improved circulation. So it's no surprise to me that when my son spends most of the day outside, he naps, he sleeps like a rock, he eats everything I give him, and there's very few emotional outbursts. When you combine these activities and practice them daily, it will support your mood Increase your energy, increase your joy. Imagine, imagine if you practice self-care for 30 minutes a day, 10 minutes of stillness, 10 minutes of movement, 10 minutes of time in nature, on top of a diet that is, in, is rich in whole plant-based foods. That's over 180 hours of self-care in a year. But I'm so busy, when am I gonna get time for 30 minutes a day of self-care? Well, we can start by looking at the five hours a day that the average person watches TV, or the 50 minutes a day that we spend on social media. We can start there. But before you get worried about adding a self-care practice onto your never-ending to-do list, remember that it is a practice. It's not about getting it right or having the perfect self-care photos for your social media. It's about showing up for yourself every day. What would be possible for you if you showed up for yourself. Thank you. <laughs>